Right. Welcome back. Uh, let's get into the next point. Uh, I'm on page 86 on your notes. Uh, so with the right, with just the right people, you can overcome the odds. Let's read Judges 7 and verse 7. God said to Gideon, I will use the 300 men who labbed at the stream to save you and give Midian into your hand. All the rest may go home. Gideon is going against the Midianite army. 32,000 men came to fight as part of Gideon's army. Now, Gideon, if you read about him, he was eventually very fearful. He said, God, you tell me, you tell me to go, I don't know. Show me proof that it is you who is leading me. So already Gideon was a little bit wavering. But 32,000 men came to fight as part of Gideon's army. Out of the territory, 22,000 were killed for that day. Now, what did God tell you, Gideon? Bring them. He said, tell them home. <laughs> so they went, they were sent home. Now, how many are left? 32,000 minus 22,000. 10,000. 10, Very good. Out of the remaining 10,000, God picked up 300. Now, how did he choose this 300? But he said, okay, there's 10,000 people. God is saying, Gideon, you don't need 10,000 people to defeat the Midianite army. But Gideon is picking more. The more people is better. He will definitely let the battle. God said, you don't need 10,000. What do you do is, you make everyone take them to the river and make everyone drink water. Those who drink water, using the water with cupped hands, and they drink, you take them and go. But those who drink by putting their mouth into the water, like how dogs drink, send them home. So now there are 10,000 people, they've all gone to the river to drink. Out of the 10,000 people, only 300 people use hands. They take water in their hands and drink. But God said, the remaining 7,000 7, people, no, 9,700. Oh, I don't know. Why. <laughs> it didn't probably ask them. Right? You know, ask them, how did you drink? Or you know, okay. Who drank water with your hands? Please come to this side. So, 300 came to say, okay, remaining same way, go back home. Right? Now, there is 300. And there is a million I have. Now I can only picture a million. I have 32,000. 32,000 are afraid we can help them. We need more people. And now in that 10,000, you said uh, uh, the rest go 9,700 people. 300 people. God said, with these 300 people, you will defeat the million I have. I have the three. But God stepped in and Gideon and his 300 men rooted the vast Midianite army and brought peace in the land of Israel for 40 years. So what did they do? Midianite army is trying to attack Israel. These 300 men under the leadership of Gideon defeated the Midianite army. They were probably thousands. And brought peace in the land of Israel for 40 years. What is the learning that we have from this? You don't necessarily need a large army of people to outdo competition. Sometimes you just need the right character, right, right people to outdo, outdo other organizations when it comes to competition, right? With just the right people in place, you can overcome the odds and fulfill the vision. And God is on our side always, right? So it says here that God stepped in and use those 300 people to win the battle. Now, what about, have you ever thought, what about those other, you know, the 10,000 who were afraid? They probably would have continued in the army. It's just that they were not part of this vision or this wonderful thing that God did. Right? What about the, the rest, 9,700 who were sent home? 
right? Maybe they also felt bad. But the point is, God was saying, Gideon, God was teaching Gideon a lesson. You don't need so many people. You just need sufficient. What if there were 10,000 people and Gideon didn't know how to you know, coordinate everyone? Tell them, you go this side, you go that side. Or what if there were, uh, you know, uh, 10,000, first there was 32,000, then there was 10,000. Now, what if there were thousands of people and Gideon didn't know how to organize them? 300 people, okay, we are able to manage them, right? And they were victorious. So even in, in when it comes to organization, when it comes to ministry, have the right team in place. Right, uh, and you we're not talking about competition in ministry, but with the right amount number of people in your team, you'll be able to be successful. That's the whole point, right? So, we are designed for maximum function and performance. Uh, organizational structure must be designed for maximized fu function and performance. Now, the structure is not just given for a show. Oh, we have the structure in place. No. The reason for the structure is maximized function, maximized performance. Right? And when you look at ministry also, we want to see our leadership team maximize right? our functions, our performance, uh, the way we do things in ministry and APC is something that we always pursue is excellence. We want to get better in what we're doing. Never be satisfied, OK, this is how I will do it. Right? Uh, the moment we come to that place, you got to change our mindset. Right? Design right, meaning the right size, not too big. The right function, doing what is best suited for it. Right? The right position placed in the optimal location. And the right collaboration with everyone doing their parts, contributing and working together. The right function, doing what is what they're best suited for. Right? Now, if you get somebody and you, uh, for example, you say, uh, you get a person who's more in the ministry side, right? Who who can lead worship, teach. You tell them, okay, you look after logistics. They may not be able to do it effectively. Yes, over time they can learn, but to be effective, they should also have the right function in place, right? So next point, break it down only to necessary levels, stay lean, stay flat. OK, Exodus 18, 13 to 26, it's a huge passage. But let me just summarize what it is, OK? Moses had a challenge. What is the challenge? He has thousands of people under him, the Israelites. How do I communicate what I want to communicate to the people? There was no mic system. There's no Instagram. There's no Facebook. There's, not, there's no TV. Nothing is there. How do I communicate? And Moses, uh, as a leader, I cannot waste my time handling all these small things. You know, he 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 was supposed to clean the tabernacle. He didn't do. Now he's blaming me. Now why should Moses look after that? It's not his problem. Or two of them fought because husband and wife have fought because they didn't cook food. Now why should Moses look after that? Right. So he's going through a problem now. He cannot be looking after small things when God has bigger things for him. Right? He has bigger responsibilities. So what did he do? He had to bring down everything that he commands, whatever God spoke to him, he had to communicate it to about 600,000 people. He had to ensure that disputes were resolved peacefully in accordance to God's standards. So what did Moses do? He brought in organization structure. Right? What did he do? He brought a judiciary process. Leaders of thousands, here, we're here, and let me just mark it here. Right? Judiciary process. Over time, leaders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Right? So you got leaders of thousand people, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, and leaders of tens. Look at the way so beautifully he, he just brought in structure there. Right? So you have maybe 1,000 leaders leading thousands, 2,000 leaders leading hundreds, 500 leading 50s, and 1,000 leading tens. This is an example, right? So now 
if two people are fighting, it doesn't have to go till Moses. Moses is busy talking to God on the mountain. We can't disturb him. So a judiciary process. They can go to the, the leader of the tens and say, hey, you know what, this is the problem. Today's manna that fell down, by the time I could cook it, it's, uh, you know, something has happened to it. So now what do I do? Right? We don't have to call for Moses for that. Right? Find out what's the resolution, finish it. Or, uh, you know, uh, uh, one thing I noticed was uh, the tent, the Ark of the Covenant, there are things that are falling out of place or it's not looked after properly. What do we do? doesn't have to go to Moses. Right? There are 50s leaders or 50s leaders of hundreds. Get things resolved in that level. Right? So even when you look at, like for us, right, when we work as an organization, we work with the hierarchy. Only if it's very important, we email the senior pastor. Otherwise, everything is done at lower level. When when it comes to budgeting, when we, when it comes to getting approvals, we send an email, right? But everything else is done here, right? And and we work together as teams, get everything done. So just to let you know, on when whenever there's a conference, right? Most of it is done by everything here. But the senior pastor knows how it's done, right? So, for example, CLC, we got everything. Everything was done. The preachers, everything was set. There's not much that, you know, they were looking after the ministry side, the, the pastors were looking after the ministry side. Okay, you have to prepare, have to preach, prepare, pray, all of that is there. So now they didn't worry about is the mic working or uh, is the, uh, uh, will the AC work? Oh, will the IT, is it live streaming working correctly? They don't bother about all that. And they should not bother about it. Because that is not their responsibility at that time. right? So these judiciary, these teams put in place must get that work done in the right way. But they, we are all aware of how the things are being done here. It's not like we are not aware. right? The senior teams are aware of everything that is done in the entire organization. Secondly, there was coordination. Again, as I mentioned, 12 captains, each one over each tribe. There was governance. 70 elders appointed to govern and address the daily needs, uh, address daily needs. 70 leaders, elders appointed. Special task force. Again, those 12 captains sent to spy from the land, spy the land of Kenna. Then there were priests responsible for the religious worship and services of the tabernacle. So. It's not like the leaders of the thousands and the hundreds, those leaders will come and start leading what is happening in the ministry side. Now, this is ministry. The priests and the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the feasts, all that is ministry side. So you had priests who were responsible for that worship and all that. Then you had Levites who were assisting the priests. Right? Now, why, why were they needed? They were needed because it was not like, you know, once a while somebody will come into the... Uh, tabernacle. There were six hundred thousand people, right? So people were going on coming. It was constant, right? So this kept things flat. This kept things. People were could access, right? If I had a problem, I could just go to the priest and say, "In in the tabernacle, this is what I'm going through. This is a problem I'm going through." Or in terms of governance, okay. Uh, in terms of where I'm staying, this is the problem I'm going through. Easy access. Problems resolved easily. Things were kept uh, flat and access to people again was easy. Right, so we come to the end of this chapter. Organizational structure and design. Any questions? Uh, even as we are learning this, uh, I hope you're able to translate this. Right. Uh, you can translate to to anything in ministry or even you may be even working for an organization right it's not like you're only for pioneers no any any place you can translate this and apply it right any questions before we go into the next chapter yes uh, is it a mandatory for every ministry like uh, is it is it mandatory for all the ministry 
like in the sense i'm asking like uh, see if we see apc apc is very different when we compare to others in in some of the ministries there will be only one pastor he'll be only leading everything and there is no assistant pastors like how we have and what we learn till now is it a mandatory thing that we have to do or is it is it comes from a particular calling like like apc have this this calling how to do the system like this they should have a system like this. or someone should have a only one leader now, that's a good question now anything done alone single handedly there's no sustainability it's not going to sustain right if one person is handling the entire ministry right logistics administration and the uh, spiritual aspect it's not going to sustain why because even if he's able to sustain it they're not going to see growth in that organization right number one two is god is a god who works in teams the lord jesus himself set the example he could have done everything on his own right uh, but jesus didn't do that he set a team in place 12 people and then he said okay he chose another 70 and he said go out on twos so you see that what we are doing at apc is not our own idea it's biblical jesus had teams jesus raised up leaders jesus was able to form teams and organize bring a structure in everything that he did and so if i am only doing everything on my own it's like i'm not following or i'm not i'm not able to see myself being fruitful now what if this one person pastor gets uh, they're saying right uh, uh gets ill right and two weeks he has viral fever what's going to happen to the church like if he's doing everything what is going to happen to the church the two weeks this two weeks he has viral fever everyone prayed over him nothing's happened two weeks what's going to happen entire ministry comes to a close like to a stop oh nobody to do bible study nobody to do friday prayer nobody to do life cell group nobody to do um, sunday services nobody for house visits disaster and so it is what we what we are doing is biblical one and two what we're doing is things that we have learned over time like what i shared with you about every conference we work six months ahead there's a reason we do that right now i'm not saying another ministry must work six months ahead right now in a town or in a village if you're doing ministry you can work two months ahead or even one month ahead right? people will come but looking at the culture looking at the people that uh, that we are ministering to they have their calendar set for the entire year, right? So the moment I want to call somebody for us for a you know for example, we're having a men's breakfast fellowship. If I want to call somebody, invite somebody to come and share. I remember doing this recently, just last week. I said, "Why don't you come and share?" He, immediately, he said, "While on the call, hold on a minute. Let me open my calendar." On the call, I said, "Can you come May 18th? We have our." men's breakfast fellowship can you come and te do a session in, on the call you said let me check my calendar so that means the entire year so those are the people that we are catering to but on the other side there may be ministries catering to villages and towns now they don't know what they're doing in the weekend that's okay you can work ahead with them but when you work ahead it it also it's it's like you're setting things in place just because you know my generation the earlier generation didn't do it doesn't mean we don't have to do it but we can set things in place so that the following generation can get better the ministry will get better everything will be organized right so for example like you're gonna you know you're you're, you're looking at your church right if you, if you bring in things in place, it was never in place. Now it's hard for your people to receive it. Why are we doing this three months before, they may ask. But you keep it. Nothing wrong, right? You're not asking them to do anything. It's just there, okay, you're announcing three months before. But the more you do it, the more the congregation will get used to it. 
hey pastor will announce this 3 months before so then if i am working i must know 3 3 uh, months before i can i'll know okay this event is there so i can apply for leave now we may think they don't work that way but we are setting standards in place right and when it comes to teams you have to have teams whether you're a village church you know recently i one of our, i met a friend of mine who came from a village right well he's a he's a pastor in a village and he was telling me you know all seven pastors in, in three villages we get together and we go out and do ministry even village churches have teams so he was saying hey i was telling him hey you're here in bangalore who's looking after church on sunday no no i have people they will go and preach village proper village right i'm, I'm talking about like you know in the middle of a you know jungle kind of village empty land but he saying i have people so it was so good to see that right uh, so he was not worried about sunday church he, you know, i have people everything is set in place and so when we come out of that mindset that okay it's always done like this we need to come out of that you you can add new things remember the things are changing right now if you send a whatsapp message to all your church members 3 months in advance good what's wrong they'll see it some of them may ignore it some of them will use it but then they'll know hey 3 months in advance whatsapp message is coming to the entire church youth meeting on this day so then they'll see oh there's some structure it's not like randomly things are happening in church they are planning they are thinking right so you can bring those things in place so uh, when when we are talking about the sustainability and successful like uh, you told uh, we we should need a team and then if we if we see apc uh, if apc if we search apc uh, pastor ashish will come pastor jakes will come pastor nancy will come pastor paul will come pastor roshan all the uh, all the pastors will come uh, and then and i can i can name some of the ministries which they alone are there and and if you ask me they are even more successful so so the thing is outside it's they are but they have teams working so for example let me take my example i want to take anyone to see so life group ministry right so if you see who's the life group coordinator paul emmanuel but under that we have so many leaders so under life group coordinator now we have zonal leaders under zonal leaders we have area coordinators under those area coordinators we have three life groups under each area coordinator now why are we doing this we are only 40 right so we have life group coordinator zonal leaders four zonal leaders north south east west under that zonal leader they have at least right now they have one area coordinator that one area coordinator will look after three life groups right so over time 20 26 if we become 60 so if we start 10 life groups in 2024 2025 another 10 life groups we become 60 i can't look after and sit and call 60 people i used to do that in 2015 hello yes brother how are you how did life group go we were 10 people now in 2026 we are 60 people i can't do that i can't visit all 60 life groups by the time i reach the life group will be over some are in south and all over the place so for me to look after the health of the life groups area coordinators are there so basically what i do is if there's a problem they email me and so it's not like if i am not there the life groups won't function not at all example i'm not there i go over two months leave everything will function properly everything all life groups will function because they know what they have to do right and even if there's a problem in the life group which needs to be resolved they may email me and if they if if i'm not able to resolve it i'll get the senior pastors involved very simple so there is no way that the life group ministry will stop impossible whether i'm there whether i'm not there it is going to grow same thing with men's ministry we have four men's coordinators not so these guys apc men's ministry coordinators so i say hey encourage registrations for uh, men's breakfast 
uh, encourage registration for men's conference. Can you do this? Can you be the MC? Can you be, uh, look up the registration desk? Can you look after book table? Uh, can you, you, you saw last time you were there for the men's conference? Uh, you were not there for the, okay. So, uh, you know, we had two tables, all of them with their laptops, right? Uh, because they have to check the registrations. Some of them are new registrations on that day. So four people on registrations. Then we have the welcome team. Now, all of that was done. But it's not like if I'm not there, all that won't be done. It's already set in place. They know men's conference, this has to happen. So there's sustainability. So whatever ministry you see in APC, one person is handling it, meaning overseeing it. <clears throat> but there are people working in that. Otherwise, you can't do it. And I can't call 40 life group leaders and find out what's happening. And we're only going to grow. Right? So when there's 60 life group leaders, we have people in place. Right? And it's just that they they report to one person. Right? And then oh, maybe once in six months, I meet with pastor and I say, this is the health of the life group ministry. These are the life groups. This is how they meet. These. Why? I got everything from the teams. But all the details from them, right? And there's coordination. So now, now the senior pastor doesn't have to go and say, okay, what's happening in this life group, this life group? He doesn't have time for all that. That's why I'm there, no? Coordinator, I have to coordinate. Now, I don't have time for all those single things. So I, I got people under me, right? Who And we all work as a team. So even if a person moves out, the ministry will continue. That is called sustainability. Mike. When, when some pastors, I mean the senior pastor, the pastor, one who is leading, if somehow he dies and all, there are many ministries who who, who came down and yes. is that the reason? Yes. Tomorrow. I think 90% of the time it's because of that. The other 10% is because of um, you know sexual immorality, money, uh, this thing, uh, using money the wrong way. But leadership. I'll give you this example. I think he did it in church history. Um, uh, William J. Seymour. Oh, what, is, what is his thing? William J. Seymour. Azusa Street Revival. The Azusa Street Revival was a powerful revival. You know what he didn't do? He didn't raise leaders. What happened? From thousands, it became 150 and 200 people. No leaders. Right? And there are many ministries like that. Right. So, for example, in APC, the entire pastoral team goes, everything will happen the same. Nothing will change. Only thing you may have some volunteers preaching. And they're used to preaching also, our volunteers and our team leaders. They're used to preach. So, all of us pack our bags and go, APC will continue. The same way, the vendors will come set the LED, <laughs> the hall, the admin team, everything will happen. So we are not running the show. It is the entire team. It's a team effort. Right? But we are there just serving. Right? right? OK. OK, let's go to the next chapter. Let's see how much we can do. Um, it's a small chapter, chapter 7. Innovation and creativity. <clears throat> innovation and creativity. Now, um, the word innovation, we know it, right? Uh, innovation is basically. Uh, coming up with ideas, right? Being creative, uh, inventing, solving problems. Hold on, let me just uh, present the notes. So in the workplace, uh, we will need to be innovative. We need to be creative, whether it's solving problem or coming up with a strategy, a breakthrough idea, ways to innovate. We need ideas. And I think one of the best examples is, uh, you know, when COVID hit, uh, we all were stuck at home. And then suddenly we, you know, uh, uh, thought about what to do with our children. And adults, we can do something, right? We can get in you know, for prayer and um, you know, Bible studies and Bible college. We can keep doing that. But what about our children? We have about, I would say, 150 to 200 children in church across all locations. So we came up with some uh, online you know, uh, children's church, which was really effective at that time. So we need to be creative. 
we need to come up with breakthrough ideas. So whether it is uh, uh, ministry, whether it is work, remember that God reveals, instructs, and teaches us. So we can always ask him. God is the source of everything. Right? Let's read Isaiah 28, 23 to 29. Isaiah 28, verse 22 to 23 to 29. Listen to what I am saying. Pay attention to what I am telling you. Farmers don't constantly plow their fields and keep getting them ready for planting. Once they have pre prepared the soil, they plant the seeds of herbs such as dill, cumin. They plant rows of wheat and barley, and at the edges of their fields, they plant other grain. They know how to do their work because God has taught them. They never use a heavy club to beat out dill seeds or cumin seeds. Instead, they use light sticks of the proper size. They do not ruin the wheat by threshing, and endless, threshing it endlessly. And they know how to thresh it by driving a cart over it without uh, bruising the grains. All this wisdom comes from the Lord Almighty. The plants God makes are wise, and they always succeed. Uh, so when you look at uh, the farmer discovering farming, scripture tells us that wisdom comes from God because God taught the farmer what to do. Put the seed in, cover it with soil, water it, and as the plant is growing, this is what you must do. Now it's not like Adam and Eve knew all of that. God, God taught them how to do it. right? And God knows everything about his creation. He knows the where, he knows the when, how, um, and he when we are when we pray, he makes those things clear to us, right? So he gives us the wisdom, and wisdom is the most important thing that we need. Ministry, or whether it is building an organization or working in an organization, wisdom, right? Let's read this Proverbs four five five through nine. Proverbs 4, 5 to 9. Get wisdom and insight. Do not forget or ignore what I say. Do not abandon wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will keep you safe. Getting wisdom is the most important thing you can do. Whatever else you get, get insight. Love wisdom, and she will make you great. Embrace her, and she will bring you honor. She will be your crowning glory. Look at that. I love this. You know, wisdom is having insight into the true nature of things. Right? Having insight. What must I do in this situation? Right? Now the situation or the season could be a good season, a difficult season, uh, or a bad season. What must I do? Right? And Wisdom is the ability to have foresight to see what things might be like in the future, right? And of course, we know about uh, King Solomon. Out of all the things that he asked, he asked for wisdom, and it was wisdom that brought him success, brought him wealth. Uh, but he did fail in a few areas, you know. Even though being wise, that's why in Ecclesiastes he 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 realizes his mistakes, right? And he says everything in this world is vain all the pleasures worldly pleasure it's all vain it, it, it's nothing and he and, and and so we need wisdom right wisdom can help us take the right course of action at the right time right um and of course over time right even as we you know get into ministry or begin to work we pray, we spend time in God's presence, in God's word. God uses all of this. right? He can give us an example from the Bible, and he can help us to walk in wisdom. Right? Uh, he can give us a word from the scriptures and help us to walk in wisdom. Or he can just give us uh, uh, you know, like a, a, a dream to make us walk in wisdom. Right? So wisdom is very important. Even as we go about doing what God has called us to do, let's ask God for wisdom. Welcome the spirit of wisdom to anoint you. 
uh, Isaiah 11 2, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. When, when we have wisdom, when we ask the Holy Spirit to anoint us with wisdom, it is very rare that we will make mistakes. Right? Because I'm not saying that we'll be perfect, but we can avoid a lot of mistakes. A lot of them. Right? Uh, just by walking in wisdom. Knowing what to say, knowing what not to say. And sometimes, you know, yesterday we were talking about the power of the tongue. Sometimes we can get in, get we can avoid a lot of problems just by knowing what not to say. Because sometimes we say things, we get into a lot of problems. Right? So that's again wisdom. There is anoint an anointing for artistic and creative skills. This is very important. Let's read this passage. How Moses, uh, how the Lord spoke to Moses in Exodus 31, 1 through 6. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezali, the son of Uri, the son of Hu, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic work. Works to work in gold, in silver, in bronze, in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. And I needed, I have appointed with him Aholia, the son of Akisamek, Akisamak, of the tribe of Dan, and I have put wisdom in the heart of all the gifted artisans that they may make all the all that i have commanded you yeah so this is very interesting god is telling moses okay moses you have a lot of work to do one is the tabernacle uh, the ark of the covenant then you have the high priest now we we want to distinguish them so we want to make it look good right so god says i put my spirit of wisdom upon these people and they will use their skills in cutting jewels, carving wood, and all kinds of workmanship. So whatever they do, they will use their skills. right? And I've put the wisdom upon them. And everything that they do will be anointed of God. So it's, it's my wisdom that I'm giving them. right? So all the craft, how, what kind of shape, what kind of wood, how to shape the wood, what kind of jewels to use, how to cut those, everything. I have given them the wisdom. But here's the very important point. They have the wisdom, but they had to you know, use their effort right, to do what God wanted them to do. It was not like they had the wisdom and they just kept it to themselves. No, they had to put their hands to the work. Right, meaning after receiving the endowment of the Holy Spirit, they had to follow it up with hard work, right? Actually, doing the work of craft, uh, art, and craft. Right. So sometimes we think wisdom is only God telling us, you know, from the scriptures. No, look at this. God is telling Moses, "I've give, I've put the anointing, the wisdom upon these two people. They will come up with all this craft. So if you want wisdom on how to." be a better graphic designer who can give you the wisdom if you want to be a better person in media and IT who can give you the wisdom God. but even as God gives you the wisdom we may have to go through courses that are available learn put our hands work hard God gives the wisdom on how to do it yes right let's go to the next point don't just identify the problem, bring the solution. Okay, let's read this passage. Uh, it's Genesis 41, 29 to 40. Talking about Joseph. It will be seven years of great plenty in all the land of Egypt. After that, there will be seven years of famine and all the good years will be forgotten because the famine will ruin the country. The time of plenty will be entirely forgotten because the famine which follows will be so terrible. The repetition of your dream means that the matter is fixed by God and that he will make it happen in the near future. 
now you should choose some man with wisdom and insight and put him in charge of the country you must also appoint other officials and take a fifth of the crops during the seven years of plenty or uh, order them to collect all the food during the good years that are coming and give them authority to store up grain in the cities and uh, guard it the food will be a reserve supply for the country during the seven years of famine which are going to come on egypt in this way the people will not step the king and his officials approved this plan and he said to them we will never find a better man than joseph a man who has god's spirit in him the king said to joseph god has shown you all the all these this so it is ob obvious that you have greater wisdom and insight than anyone else i will put you in charge of my country and all my people will obey your orders your authority will be second only to mine Pharaoh has a dream, and now nobody is there to interpret the dream. So they call Joseph. Joseph comes. He begins to interpret the dream. He says, "What? Fourteen years. I know what's going to happen in the next fourteen years. First seven years is going to be years of abundance, but the next seven years, the fattened calf is the seven years of abundance. But the seven." Next seven years is going to be years of dryness, famine in the land. So, what did Joseph do? With God's wisdom, God spoke to him. He was able to interpret the dream. Now, after interpreting the dream, he didn't just say, "Okay, should I go back? I was just doing something in the prison." No, he interpreted it, and he came up with a solution. He says, "Okay, King. So now that we identified the problem, how do we solve it?" Seven years, just store up, so that for the next seven years you'll have plenty to eat, and the entire nation of Egypt can be saved. See, Joseph acted in wisdom. He didn't say Egypt, no good. Seven years, you'll eat. Next seven years, famine. Then you don't, uh, you know. Then you'll all suffer and die. Good. No. Now he was in prison. He could have wished bad for them. he came up with a solution and because of that he became second in command in egypt we know the story right so don't just identify the problem try to resolve it in ministry in the workplace we will have problems right we will have you know for example you have a conference or you have a meeting you know, there may be a problem if i identify the problem but how do i resolve it come up with a solution Right, put your hands together. You've got teams in place. All of them come, brainstorm ideas, see what's the best idea. Try to resolve the problem. Don't just be a pro person who identifies the problem, but step in to resolve it. Right, step out and to think and act in familiar territory. First Chronicles twenty ten twelve and nineteen. First Chronicles chapter twenty four was then. 28 verse 10 Look sharp now God has chosen you to build his holy house be brave determined and do it Then David presented his son Solomon with the plans for the temple complex porch store rooms meeting rooms and place for anointing sacrifice atoning sacrifice He turned over the plans for everything that God's spirit had brought to his mind the design of the courtyard the arrangements of rooms and the closets of for storing all the holy things here are the blueprints for the whole project as god gave me to understand it david said many of us or stop us from becoming innovative is because we get into uncharted territory meaning i may not know it right and so i may not be good at it but look at david david he he became from a shepherd boy god brought him to leadership he became the king of israel and now he he knows about military he knows about administration now he's telling solomon solomon i cannot build a temple 
So now you have to build the temple. Take the blueprints. This is something that came in my mind. This is some design. Now, he's not done any course in architecture, David. He knew about you know uh, armies and uh, administration, but architecture is not something that he. We don't see him, uh, you know, involving in that in his, as a king. But here he's saying, here the, see, here are the blueprints of the whole project that God gave me. So now I'm giving you this. You can apply this, make it better, and build the temple for God. So David was not only, now he's almost going to die. He was not saying, Solomon, go do it. But he was willing to take that extra step of stepping out of his comfort zone to territory that he was not used to. And he said, Solomon, this is something that God has given me. Take it, use it. So sometimes God can ask us to walk in that uncharted territory, places where we may not be comfortable or may not be well-versed with, may not be skilled at, right? But then step out. If God is directing your paths, do it, right? Because he is the source of all wisdom. Now, even as we step out, so for example, I want to become a graphics, I want to learn graphics, right? Now, I, I'm not much into graphics. But if I want to learn it, there's nothing wrong, right? I, I go learn a few courses. Okay, then I talk to some graphic designers, get their ideas, get their inputs, and work on it, right? So what am I doing? I'm actually going to territory that I'm not very familiar with. But God can give me ideas on how to get things done, right? So be willing to do that. Then enhance your knowledge, understanding, and skill. Uh, we look at Daniel 117, as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had the understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, we know the story of Daniel. Daniel and his friends are in Babylon, in a foreign land. They've been selected to look after things in the palace. God stepped in. Even as they began to learn and grow in the culture and the administration of the entire you know, we can say it was the office, right? So there was a temple, there was an office. Daniel is in the office, literature, learning, all that he was doing there. And God stepped in, empowered these young men as they worked by acquiring knowledge, understanding, and skill. Enhance your knowledge, understanding, and skill. So that's what I always tell young people, right? Uh, don't waste time. Go back. Now we have everything on the phone. Uh, you know, read things, read and learn. You know, I've, I've been <clears throat> studying on a, uh, on an entire series and on uh, you know how to speak. Uh, you know, what was that called? Uh, uh, public speaking, right? On public speaking. So I've been listening to this whole series. It's powerful. A lot of insights, a lot of understanding, right? Uh, on how to speak, how to speak well, and actions. You know, they have so many things involved. Right, um, sentence construction, English, gram grammatical words to use, how to make a big sentence by you just using a few words. So many things. Enhance your skills, whatever skill you have, enhance it. Right, enhance your understanding as well. Finally, use your imagination and train your memory. Uh, for Second Timothy one seven, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. So. Uh, our mind is our imagining, our reasoning, our memory. Uh, that means train and develop our mental faculties, right? Use your imagination, train your memory. And even as we do all of this, God begins to bring innovation into our spirit, into our soul. God begins to bring creativity into us. And thus, we will continue to glorify God in our lives, right? So we'll stop here. Uh, uh, we'll pick up from next class from chapter eight, which is very interesting. People, processes, performance, and rewards. Right. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great week ahead. I'll see you next Monday. Thank you, everyone online. God bless. Mm -hmm.